Though we may be small islands, we are surrounded by large oceans and these oceans provide resources for our communities which are both intrinsic and valuable, defining who we are. Clean oceans foster a healthy and sustainable future for our islands. So how can we incorporate sustainable practices to a biome like the ocean, which is so crucial to our economy? My name is Andy Lybert and this is Islands on Alert, a podcast where we discuss how climate change has already affected our islands, what's in store for us if the earth continues to warm, and how we can help to reduce devastating impacts. When we hear climate change mitigation, we typically think of replanting trees, recycling our plastics, and saving electricity by turning off our lights. We focus on our land, what we walk and build on. Our oceans are left out of the conversation. We also forget about the potential that oceans have for carbon capturing and minimizing the effects of global warming. The World Bank refers to this potential as the blue economy. The blue economy recognizes the value of our oceans, seeking to both harness their capacity for food, carbon capturing, while also keeping them clean and healthy. Small islanders have a more nuanced idea of what the blue economy means. So today, to explain this perspective, we have Angelique Popenu. Angelique is a Seychelles environmentalist and climate lawyer. She helped to start the SIDS Youth AIM Hubs, which is recognized as the NGO responsible for the plastic bags ban in the Seychelles. More recently, she has trained as a climate change negotiator under the AOSIS Fellowship Program. She currently is the CEO for SACAT, which invests in ocean stakeholders to generate new learning, bold action, and sustainable blue prosperity and the Seychelles. Well, hello there, Angelique. Thank you so much for being with us for this, our latest edition of our podcast. Hi. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you very much. No problem whatsoever. But uh, first and foremost, and I ask each of our guests this, a little bit about your, your home, the Seychelles. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, so uh, I am calling in from the Seychelles. It's an archipelagic state of 115 islands scattered um, around the Western Indian Ocean. So if we try to map it out, we're talking all the way from the northern coast of Somalia, dotted with islands across the ocean, all the way to the southern border of Mozambique. Uh, And we have an ocean space of 1.35 million kilometers square of exclusive economic zone, uh, dependent on tourism and fisheries for our main economic pillars, and a small population, I think very similar to Antigua, of about 95,000. Great, beautiful, and and hopefully I get to visit the Seychelles someday. But uh, how did you first get involved with climate change, um, especially as it relates to ocean conservation? Yeah. So I, I grew up in the Seychelles, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and had, a, I think, a pretty typical island upbringing, you know, uh, uh, picnics here and there. Um, I was, the, I think something that was not typical of Seychelles was children. Uh, I, I did learn how to swim at a young age and really love swimming. Um, and I, I guess I, I was very fond of the sea, but, you know, as with all things, when you take things for granted and you appreciate the foreign, um, a, a, an absolute love for swimming pools, perhaps too much, in fact. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I love the island. I, I, but, I, but I have to say, I, I took a lot for granted. Um, and when I left uh, Seychelles, you know, like Antigua, we didn't have a university of our own at the time. Um, and I left to pursue um, my legal studies in the UK, I, I, I didn't realize just how much I had until you didn't have it at your doorstep or, you know, open the, the window and stare out onto the horizon. And the things that you once took for granted, you started to really reflect on. 
Mm. But the thing that happened in Seychelles is, of course, I left um, before or just about the start of the macroeconomic reform by the IMF in Seychelles. And as a result of that, Seychelles went through a stark transition um, to attract foreign direct investments and and uh, other investments to bring a uh, foreign exchange into the country. So when I came back, I felt the country looked really different. Um, the muddy footpath that I was accustomed to was now a boardwalk to a five-star hotel. Uh, and that really inspired me to think about the importance of sustainable development. And of course, you cannot divorce sustainable development from issues of climate change. Uh, and that's when I decided to start the NGO, but also you know how it is. Uh, people don't take you too seriously when you're doing advocacy. Uh, they want you to, you know, if she's if she's trained in a particular um, area, then people see legitimacy and, and and so on. So I then went on after three years of uh, practicing as a as a lawyer in Seychelles to um, specialize in environmental law, um, and that's where my journey begins as. Uh, a specialist in climate issues of climate justice, uh, marine conservation, but also um, very much the nexus between the two, right? How does ocean and climate interplay? Now, there's often this pronounced separation between the terrestrial land and oceans. And in another interview, I can recall, um, Janine Felsen, um, she calls small islanders the custodians of the ocean. Now, why are land dwellers so interconnected with the ocean? Yeah, I think we can't survive without the ocean, right? So we yeah. have to take care of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I personally don't think that is something that is uh, unique to islanders. The world will not survive without the ocean. But because of our proximity, our cultural connection, um, and other forms of connections with, with the ocean, inevitably uh, islanders become its custodian. And we are in a, in, a, in a convenient, accessible place to be able to tell the world about the state and health of the ocean. Uh, and that of course is very much linked to proximity and the connection that we have with it. If you think about your coastal communities, they are out on the sea, every day if not every other day and if there's something wrong with the with the ocean they would be the ones to tell you and i think obviously that voice should carry beyond just your local community but to the international uh, sphere and pol international policy making space which is really where you know that climate um, ocean international policy making comes in important question here angelique how serious of an issue is climate change and uh, have you seen the effects of climate change in the Seychelles? Have I seen it uh, yeah. every day? Every day. Um, it, it manifests in different ways. Um, mm. And I, I can give, you know, concrete examples to concrete examples and things we also foresee will happen. Um, concrete mm. examples are, of course, um, how every morning you wake up and the tarmac road or that was once a tarmac road is now has a huge speed bump of sand across it. Um, you know, it's, it's signs, <laughs> it's signs of the ocean coming to claim, um, mm -hmm. claim the land. And there are other, and, and for us as a, as a small island developing state, as, as you know, we're so dependent on tourism where many of our, many of our um, tourism establishments have all been put along the coastline, right? People want to be able to sit in their rooms in the hotels and, and look out to, to the sea. So what we find as well is the ocean is, is in the swimming pools of these hotels, right? They're, they're, they're coming in. And I think the other one that people don't really think about and you know there's so many examples the coral reefs dissolving um, but the one that many people don't realize is, is how it affects fisheries and when it comes to fisheries for Seychelles as the host of the biggest um, tuna canning factory in the Indian Ocean um, we are aware that pelagic fish like tuna are sensitive to the temperature 
of the sea. So they like cooler temperatures and that's where they like to live. <laughs> um, and now with warming oceans, what we find is the tuna are migrating to cooler latitudes. So an economic activity that has sustained uh, an economy for so many years is really at threat. Um, and for Seychelles to also be thinking about how are we building our resilience to these threats and how do we use things like the blue economy to do that? Okay, now, now that just brings us right to the topic of this episode, the blue economy. How do you define it? What exactly is the blue economy? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the blue economy dates back some time. In fact, I've been trying to trace its origins, but it's definitely before Rio um, plus 20 in 2012. Um, And my definition of the blue economy is one where we are sustainably using uh, our marine resources whilst maintaining the health of the ecosystems and ensuring social equity in the process of doing so. Um, So that would be my definition of the blue economy. It's based on three pillars, generating economic prosperity, um, social equity, as well as um, ocean health. Now, when you think of the ocean, it is extremely vast. So how, how can we, what value do we put to it? Well, there are, there have been um, evaluations of the ocean, you know, like, uh, I think there are some statistics along the lines of if the ocean was a country, it would be the third biggest economy or the, you know, there, there are some, some valuations about just its economic um, value in terms of understanding the various uh, services that it offers, whether it's through shipping, um, marine biotechnology and, and fisheries. Um, But then there's something else called ecosystem valuation, right? So here we're looking more at ecosystem valuation. So we're thinking about that seagrass meadow. It's doing more for me than I'm necessarily putting a value on it. So when that seagrass meadow or those mangroves are absorbing carbon out of the atmosphere to combat climate change, they're providing a service to me, but I don't put a value on that. So those are the exercises or um, uh, assessments that are currently being taking that are being taken place in in different countries is I mean in the Seychelles we're certainly doing it where we're doing evaluation of our ecosystem services all right now is there a difference then between the blue economy and the ocean economy absolutely so the ocean economy is an economy that has existed for, for a very long time, right? Um, and it's wor- that's worth mentioning because people have been uh, navigating the seas for time immemorial, right? Since we could put a plank of wood and float it on the ocean, we've been navigating the seas. And economic exploitation of the ocean has been one that has been present, but it has been done in a way that has not necessarily taken into consideration ocean health, and it certainly hasn't taken into consideration social equity. And I'll give you some concrete examples here. Sure. And it, you know, a funny one, I suppose, where uh, it's bad luck to have a woman on board the vessel. The whole idea that women had to be excluded from um, from careers that involved going out on a on a boat. Um, is already one example where social equity was not being factored in Um, and and how such an activity could generate prosperity in a more inclusive way. So, but at the same time, there have been industries like fishing um, and we've done it in so many ways with sometimes destructive fishing years. You know, we've, it's only over time that we've now had these um, mechanisms to ensure turtles are able to escape and, and things like that. Dolphins are able to escape. But that's, for me, the ocean economy is something that has existed. But what, what was missing was the sustainability, right? What was missing was the other pillars. Um, so when we talk about the blue economy, and I know some people actually say the sustainable blue economy, and I always say, well, sustainable and blue mean the same thing. Um, 
the sustainable economy means that yes, we are still pursuing some some of the activities like fishing, um, but we're doing it in a informed and sustainable way. So we're making sure that we're having um, the stock assessments, we're knowing the health of our ocean before we go and extract, um, and we're we're getting the the necessary data that we need in order to move sustainably. And what most importantly, or equally importantly, I should say, uh, women are part of it. Um, for example, and I, I use women as a as an, a, a group example. That uh, of course there are others. So that for me are is are the differences between an ocean economy um, and blue economy. And and just to end on a on another note because a lot of people have criticize the blue economy as repackaging old wine. Um, and thinking about it as it's the ocean economy, but now we want to use the ocean as the next frontier, right? We want to direct people towards the sea because we've already exploited all we can on, on, the, on the terrestrial space. And I think we really need to move away from that. The ocean economy is different from the blue economy or what some people call the sustainable blue economy. So if I get you right here, then the blue economy is mainly about sustainability. Yes. Okay. Well, you have managed to define it very beautifully there, but I'd, I'd want to push it a bit further. And if you can, if you can narrow down the definition of what the blue economy means for Islanders. The blue economy for islanders um, and its people, I mean, islands and its people, um, it, it's, a, it's an economic pathway for development, okay. right? So um, that's, for me, that's the way we should see it. It's that pathway to generate prosperity, uh, but not only for this generation, but for future generations. So you're actually um, making an effort to to manage your resources as sustainable as you possibly can in an informed way and that provides resilience because of course it means that your resources are going to last you longer but it also um, provides you an opportunity for a low carbon growth and what that means is Perhaps an activity may fall under the ocean economy, um, but because of its greenhouse gas emissions, which of course threatens our very existence, it doesn't fall under the sustainable blue economy. Now, there's obviously a focus on economic prosperity with the blue economy. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what a debt for nature swap means? I've heard this term pretty often over the last uh, few months, um, debt for nature. And how is it applied to the Climate Relief Initiative? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a debt for nature swap, so this is an old concept, right? This is, has been around since the 80s. But it was being applied to terrestrial space. So basically, a country would have its debt either forgiven, so complete relief, alternatively restructured, so on more favorable terms, so let's say the interest rate would go down, uh, the payment period would be longer, um, and things like that. Uh, or, you know, the currency for repayment would be changed to the local currency. And in return for that debt relief or restructure, the country would have to um, commit to protecting uh, an area of forest, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it has been done in the Caribbean, um, in Latin America, for many, many years, um, in, and it started somewhat in the 80s. Now, what's, what's unique in the Seychelles, and, and I think there's a next step to, to get to, what's unique in the Seychelles was it was the first time that we did a debt for ocean swap, <laughs> mm. right? So rather than our focus being on um, terrestrial, and of course we, we're a small island, we don't have that much terrestrial space anyway, um, the area of protection in return for that debt restructure was to protect 
um, 30 percent of our exclusive economic zone. Now, what's interesting about this, though, is, of course, that there are climate opportunities through marine conservation, right? So we go back to that link between ocean and climate. So what was part of the debt swap was also looking at the representation of, of things we are protecting in the ocean. So we couldn't just like carve out 30% and say, there you go, that's protected. We actually had to uh, look at the science and look at the best available information to us, and one of which included making sure that we were protecting what, we, what I referred to as blue carbon ecosystems. So we're protecting mangroves, we're protecting seagrass, which means through these protections, we're also combating climate change. So often what we hear is that Seychelles also had uh, what can be termed a debt for climate swap, right? Because there were climatic objectives or climate change related objectives, part of our swap. Um, but in terms of uh, working, how it's working in Seychelles, yes, you know, we've got the debt restructure. Um, and I go back to my pillars of blue economy, we've got the debt restructure. Uh, we've got uh, the 30% marine protected areas um, that was gazetted in um, March of 2020. And then finally, uh, with the funds that have been made available through that debt restructure, um, we are now funding projects to support local communities to also be involved in marine protection and sustainable management, as well as sustainable fisheries. So there you've got that social equity component of getting people through grants that um, SACAT, the organization I lead, um, provides uh, to support people uh, to be part of that transition. Well, Angelique, thank you so much for clearing all of that up and bringing some clarity on these important matters. It's been an absolute joy speaking with you. Thank you so much for sharing. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. We'll be right back after the break. As Angelique mentioned, fisheries are crucial to the blue economy, and small-scale fishermen are the experts behind the operation. These fishermen are key in guaranteeing the success of the blue economy, and more importantly, they are stewards of our ocean ecosystems. As a small islander, fishing is woven into the fabric of our everyday lives. It is a major contributor to the overall food security of small island states and the development of our local economies. Now, to speak about his career and sustainable fishing in Antigua and Barbuda, we have a very special guest, Mitchell Lay. Uh, Mitchell works with the Caribbean Network of Fisher Folk Organizations, where he advocates for small-scale fisheries. Mitchell, how are you doing? Um, always, always good hearing from someone from beautiful and sunny Antigua. <laughs> uh, thank you, Andy. Um, good morning to you and to all of our listening audience and guests. Uh, now, now, let's get down to brass tacks. How and when did you get involved with fishing? Is it from an early age? And um, have you been involved ever since? So, so we can't speak about age because we associated with the ocean from the time we were born. <laughs> I mean, so that is, is something difficult to say. But um, my father was involved in, in fishing in terms of owning a boat, although he didn't actually fish commercially, but he owned a boat. And mm -hmm. we would also fish, um, sport fishing from the shore as well, from the time I was a youth. So from that perspective, um, so for lifelong. Mm -hmm. In terms of commercially fishing, fishing for a living, so I got involved probably close to the 1990s, the late 1980s. Ah, wonderful. And you've been involved ever since. I have been involved ever since. So so you live close to the coastline in Antigua then? So Antigua is pretty small. So wherever you live, you're close to the coastline. But <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting that answer, you know. I was expecting that answer. <laughs> but but, but we, we can walk to the beach. It probably will take half an hour mm -hmm. um, or a little more. Um, so if, if you say that's close, yes. 
So therefore, fishing means a lot to you. Um, what is a day like in the life of a typical fisherman like yourself? Okay, so if you speak about a typical fishing day, then we speak about pre-preparation the day before, yes? Leaving home before the sun is up. And for me personally, I get back after the sun goes down. So that's a typical fishing day for me. Um, not for everyone, but because of the way I fish, that, that's a typical fishing day. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I've got a pretty good idea that, I mean, in terms of the different types of fishing, I know there are several ways. I'm like line fishing, um, who stay close to the coastline, others who go further out. What what exactly is your method, um, Mitchell? So we're really very deep. So we have fish, sunlight doesn't penetrate at all. We're from deep corals, but then it's difficult to, to really um, assess the level of coral. Um, in that depth. Um, so we hardly engage in coral directly. Um, although there are ways to fish within the coral systems that are sustainable as well. Um, but we, we really go offshore. Um, what you, you refer to as the deep slope. Um, so it's really the island shelf slopes down to the continental shelf. So where do you go though? Because I know some people go around the coral reefs, which has, of course, been a a sort of traditional breeding ground for many of our fish. Is that where you venture? Or do you go off the shelf? Yes. So that's typically uh, the area that I um, specialize in in, and target in. Okay. And and what type of fish do you get out there? They're all red snappers. Um, Typically, occasionally, we get a group of... um, Sometimes we get some amber jack um, and other jacks, but typically all red snappers. Most days we get 99 to 100% red snappers, different types, but all red snappers. I wouldn't come to you because you're not saying anything about old wife, which of course is my favorite delight. So I'm very sorry. (laughs) (laughs) No worries. I I have sufficient customers. Tell us a little bit about your, your customers, your clients. Um, what are they like? Because I know on weekends, the, the, the market in St. John's, the capital of Antigua, gets pretty much uh, packed. Um, and that is for anywhere you go in the Caribbean and uh, probably for a lot of small islands across the globe. Do you go down to the market to sell uh, or do you sell, because um, I've seen it, from the beach? Um, do you sell from your home? How do you commercialize your catch? So typically we employ two different marketing strategies. There's one where we sell directly to homeowners, to the families. And then there's the other strategy where we sell directly to people who then resell. So we call them middlemen or vendors, if you prefer. Yeah. Um, so we typically have orders. So, so we have, of course, our own clientele, our customer base. Um, and, and that's pretty much tied in now because we, we really don't, oh, we, produ- we don't produce sufficient to satisfy all of them, um, generally. Mm-hmm. In the past, we've sold directly to hotels, but we, we tend to leave that to the, the middlemen. So they have a livelihood as well. The red snapper is extremely popular. Is that your favorite type of fish to catch? And is it because it meets the demand of customers? So, so in terms of the business aspect, mm-hmm. red snappers are targeted mainly because I can more or less guarantee the type of fish based on the habitat I'm, I'm targeting. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I, I guarantee red snappers, different types, but red snappers. But the real key element here is that the customers are really attracted to red snappers. So the, the marketability is high. So I, I can get all that I catch sold. All right, tell me something, Mitchell. Do you go out alone? Do you go out fishing alone? So generally, yes. In the past, I've employed other people, but yeah. it's increasingly difficult to find people who have the level of dedication that is required. When you speak of dedication, what do you mean by that? So I leave home before dark, yeah. before light, mm-hmm. and I come home after dark. And... That says it all. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, uh, I mean, we, we have tried other people, but we have really designed our um, operating space to, to be able to accommodate a one-man operation. Yeah. And also accommodate somebody else if, if we have, you know, but certainly we can operate by ourselves. There's a deep and rooted connection between islanders and the ocean. Uh, I'm sure there is uh, that same personal connection with the ocean. Uh, could you tell us about that? So I'm, I'm really, there's nothing boring about the ocean. The okay. ocean has life and dynamism. The ocean is never the same two days in a row. The ocean is never the same within a specific day, any given day. So the ocean is extremely dynamic. So there's nothing at all boring, whether I'm by myself or whether there's someone with me. So the ocean is an exciting place to be in. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the ocean affords you a certain level of tranquility and peace, even in the midst of a roaring sea, because it doesn't come with the interferences of, of human interaction, and uh, which can be quite difficult. The most difficult things we have to face in life is managing relationships. Um, so the ocean affords you a sense of tranquility and peace, even when you're working what you would consider pretty hard. Mm -hmm. So it's never boring because it's dynamic, always changing, never the same. And your catch is also like that. Question 13, one more time. You, you are an amazing observer, Mitchell, of our natural world because similarly we have spoken with island advocates and scientists uh, during the recordings of these episodes and you're seeing things that may not be even available to the eyes of scientists. Uh, do you realize the, the, the power you hold as a steward of our ocean? Yes, but also I, I would say to you, Andy, mm -hmm. that um, we have to be realistic and, and understand that even though we don't place much emphasis on small scale fisheries or the fisher folk themselves, they are major contributors to island economies. And perhaps you would learn some lessons and I, I don't see the political leadership learning too many good lessons, but they, I, I think they should. And one of the lessons is um, local food production is not only of a better quality, but it guarantees some economic activity and some food sovereignty. Thank you, Michelle, for sparing some time to, to speak with us. And here's wishing for an amazing catch the next time you venture out. Hey, you're welcome, Andy. Take care. I'm your host for Islands on Alert, Andy Liebert. Islands on Alert is produced by Leila Henry and Louis Price, under the Alliance of Small Island States media team. Special thanks to Tashwa James and Bianca Bedu for additional scripting. Join us next time.